Hi, and welcome to the latest in the Press Pass series here on the podcast. And this is a great series where we have a chance to speak to broadcasters and journalists, quite often with an AFC Bournemouth link, but always with a football connection. And this week, we have two faces who you'll know through both hearing and seeing them on your TV and, of course, on online media as well. Now, coming up later in the show, we'll be speaking to Matt Davies Adams the host of the Totally Football League show and also on the main Totally Football pod who's alongside James Richardson, a person who, after our win against Manchester United last season, he made a certain prediction about AFC Bournemouth that came true, much to the hatred of Jeff, should we say hatred? Well, I'm sure we'll reveal more later in the show. Now, before we introduce our first guest, I will bring in uh, Jeff Hayward, who's with me. And uh, how's it going, Jeff? Yeah, you know, not bad, not bad. I'm quite a forgiving person, so I've I've got over that. You know that, don't you, Sam? Hatred's the wrong word. I, yeah. you know, I think it is, but you know, I'll find the right word later on. How are you? Um, how are you finding the will to muster up some excitement during this international break, Jeff? Well, I've got to be honest. England playing three games is, you know, I'm I'm struggling to get up for it, to be honest. But um, yeah, you know, it is what it is. We got well, at least we got we got two weeks off, haven't we? That's the way to look at it. Yeah, two weeks off indeed. So let's bring in our first guest. And it was last month when we were all settled down to watch the Cherries play St Andrews for the first time this season against Coventry. And with Sky Sports on the TV, we only go and hear them referencing this podcast regarding our riches in attacking options. Absolutely loved that. And the person who did that uh, was presenter Caroline Barker. Caroline, how are you? Oh, what a delight, boys. Um, although I won't be listening back to myself. Uh, I won't do that. But I do I do listen to you every week. So, um, yes, I, I, won't, I won't listen back to myself after this one. But why not mention you? you? You are the ones that go and do all the legwork. You're the ones that know your clubs inside out. So, yeah, you deserve a mention every week. Cheers. Yeah, much appreciated. And uh, Caroline, you, so you can be seen presenting the EFL on Sky, also can be heard on Five Live, the World Service, Premier League Productions. And also, can I just say, as someone who loves darts, I've got to say, you did a cracking job with the Champions League of darts on um, on the oh. BBC. And you, you know, between you on the BBC and uh, Jackie O on ITV, darts is, is in safe hands, I've got to say. I love myself a bit of the Arras. Um, yeah. That's my misspent youth, I think, in, in some of the, the darts clubs in Essex. Uh, I'll say darts clubs, not pubs, um, which I maybe was in as well with that misspent youth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, I think um, darts has always kind of followed me around from, from here in Essex to London with working. And it's just another level of, of people that want to help you out, that want to talk to you, that want to talk about their, their sport. And that's kind of all you look for, isn't it? You want, a, you want a good story and people who can make that story come alive. So love the darts. Mm. So we're here to talk about football, though. And obviously there's an obvious question, which is, which is often greeted by an obvious answer, actually. But I'm going to ask it anyway. How are you enjoying football season so far? <laughs> well, as someone that's getting to do the sport that they love, uh, getting to be part of the EFL, it's my my first season fully at Sky, and just they've they've been brilliant. And and the only 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 huge downside is just that we're not in the the stadiums with the fans. And I know that sounds like the the thing that everyone should say, but it's true. It's it's. It's not the same, and that's the only negative on this season so far. I'm getting to go and watch games. I'm getting to talk to some brilliant people. I got to, to follow Northern Ireland in, in Europe. And again, just to be inside the ground with some fans as we get to experience in, in the Euro playoffs has, has been something that's that's been missing. So just hopeful, hopeful that we can get that back in some shape or form, not least for you know, my football club playing the National South and it's it's at the moment crippling a lot of our clubs not having the, the fans in. And I know that's happening further up, but the, the real impact of it lower down the levels. These community clubs is, you know, it stinks at the moment, absolutely stinks. And we've got to we've got to bring them along with us. So that, those are the negatives. But but how lucky are we to talk about, to watch football? I get to spend Friday night. We just sit there eating and watching football, as you can probably tell. Yeah. Brilliant. And is Chelmsford you support, Caroline? Yeah, yeah. Since, um, well, I used to get strapped to the back of the stand in my baby bouncer. Um, I'm the last of six. So my my four 
older siblings were always taken along and then my parents had a 12 year gap accidentally fell for the brother above me and then I was born as the friend for him and so I was dragged along to whatever they were doing and, and from the very first the week after because my mum was still in hostel ill from having me understandable I came out at six foot so that's probably why and <laughs> and so I was I was taken along while she was still in in hospital to the ground and, and you get hooked don't you you get hooked by the, the players that come over and talk to you after a game by uh, the friends that you meet, the sharing of sweets, the the cold nights, the last gasp goals, those moments that you and maybe a few other yeah. hundred people have seen going down to Truro with 78 other fans and making that journey. You know, these <laughs> these kind of journeys on a, on a rotten Tuesday night when it's raining, uh, the Gravesend and Northfleet fans, as were then, soon to become Ebsfleet after this time, they, I remember them all booing us and laughing at the fact that the bridge was closed and we'd have to go halfway around London to get home from Kent to Essex. You know, that is, it sounds silly, but those those moments that, that are your formative years. And uh, my, my dad used to take me down. He was the key holder at New Visual Street, which is long departed. Is that It was a hulking, great giant of a ground in the centre of Chelmsford, right next to Essex County's um, cricket ground so if you ever saw the long distance shots of the cricket ground when Essex are playing the football ground was right near it had the old candlestick lights around the side the roll over the top of the barn and I used to go down and, and wash every seat on a Saturday morning before the game um, in the old wooden stand and yeah those those moments that just stay with you forever Wow. That's, wow. There's no reply to that, is there, Sam? So. <laughs> no, there isn't. And uh, we're pleased to say that uh, Matt Davies-Adams has joined us as well. So, Matt, how are you, sir? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm very well. How are you guys doing? Don't let him yeah. in. Yeah. Don't let him in. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. You just missed Carol telling us all about her life as a Chelmsford City fan. Right, OK. Yeah, I, I feel like I've heard that story. It's, it's much more <laughs> romantic than mine, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely love it. So, um, yeah, we spoke about Matt earlier. He is the commentator for Chelsea T, the, the host of the uh, Total Football League show, straight out of Cobham and Two Stars podcast. Uh, Matt, um, you know, working for Chelsea TV, I can I can presume a lot of Blues are quite delighted that AFC Bournemouth are no longer in the Premier League. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, tell me about it. It seemed like every year you guys came to, to Stamford Bridge and, and won and... and... Always played really well. And yeah, certainly last season for me, it was a bit embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah we're, right, uh, we're right in the middle of an international break at the moment. Um, uh, Caroline, how busy is it for you in this international break so far? Uh, ever so. The fact that I've been I've been lucky to be with Northern Ireland and, and their roller coaster through the Euro playoffs. But then we get to do League One and Two. So the focus switches from from the championship to, to League One and League Two games, which I always think is is the other side of, of the job that I love doing, particularly at the end of the season when you get to do the playoffs as well. So when you think of all the big teams that are down there, we're doing um, Portsmouth next week, and you just, all these, these sides that have been there, done that, the great players too, and the younger players coming up and, and through, many of which, which will go on and we'll see in the Premier League too. So it's it's good to keep half an eye on, on them as well. And, and Matt, what do you prefer? Do you prefer doing sort of totally football league, totally football in the Premier League, Chelsea TV? What's what's your uh, what's your best gig? I love them all. Is the is the boring but but honest answer? And, and I love that it, it, it's so varied the, the different you know levels of football that I work at, if you like. But I think it's still just about Chelsea TV because I see myself as a commentator more than than anything else. That's what I'd always wanted to be. That was the reason why I got into the into the industry in the first place. And and Chelsea and, and WSL is really the only commentary that I do at the moment. I found particularly over the international break. Actually, I've been doing at least one podcast a day, and um, this is my third of today. Um, so commentary is the, is the one thing that that's always been a massive, massive passion of mine. But I love doing the podcast as well because it gives you the chance to just. Talk about football and there's nothing better than, than doing that for a living. You're a Forest fan, right? Is that right? I am, yeah. Um, for my sins, etc. and so on. My uh, mum had a season ticket the year that we won the league. My stepmother went to both European Cup finals. Uh, my first game was a 4-0 win against Man United, believe it or not. Um, but since then, I've seen us 3-0 down at home to Plymouth after half an hour. I've seen us in the League One relegation zone. Basically had no glory whatsoever. So it's been um, been a strange season in all leagues so far. I mean, 
in the Premier League this weekend felt like the uh, just changed about 30 times. I don't know. Um, but it's it's been bizarre in the Championship as well. Uh, Caroline, what's your take on how the season is shaped up so far? We've got one extreme to the other, haven't we? We've seen, I think it's over, well, exactly half of the games have been 0-0, 1-0 or 1-1, so low scoring. And then you go and see teams get tonked at the other end. Mm. And then we've got Adam Armstrong and... Ivan Tony with their their own goal race, so it's it's just it's definitely having an effect uh, an effect not having the, the fans in, and I don't know I don't know which way it will go. The, the perceived opinion is that the three that were relegated will go back up, but who knows? Reading and their start, I mean, streaky now was it was it top loaded? Uh, the the awful run that they've been on, not entirely sure that they'll stay up in the in the top five, let alone top of the the table you've got new managers coming in from outside i know uh, i saw quite a few um uh, bournemouth fans having a go about i think there was a comment somewhere about oh well your your manager hasn't managed in the league so we don't know we don't know how he'll do we can't see them sustaining it but they're they're the interesting stories right whether these these managers that come out from outside that are trying different methods how they get these teams ticking and, and working again a real quality of players in the in the league through the championship. So, yeah, you're you're a better man than I am a woman if you can work out exactly who's going up or, or down at the moment. Even, you know, Wickham putting together a, a run. Sheffield Wednesday then sacking Gary Monk. It, it, that their results are all going to change again down the bottom. And, and Matt, I mean, you're, you're renowned amongst Bournemouth fans for being a great predictor. So, <laughs> who... Who were your three to go back up at the start of the season? And is it working out as you expected? Well, I retired from the predictions game at the end of last season. Um, <laughs> if only oh. if only to save my mentions on Twitter from, from Bournemouth fans. But um, no, I, I actually, this, this, this is a pick that Caroline made last year and it, it didn't work out. But I think it was, it was rooted in something which is going to bear fruit uh, this year. I reckon Stoke are... Uh, are nailed on to go up. I think they look a really, really good squad to me. Uh, but but they've got a good manager who sorted them out, which has been really difficult for the last few incumbents to do. I think they, they've had a year to get used to the championship last year. They did well to avoid relegation, actually, because they were utterly calamitous at some points in it. But I really fancy them to, to have a very strong season. Obviously, Norwich, Watford and Bournemouth have got an advantage over, over other teams. In particular, you know, there's lots of players there for all three of those sides who you thought may well have moved on in the summer and didn't and providing that they are sufficiently motivated to play in the championship that's a huge advantage for for those three clubs and you think of people like Emi Buendia and Ishmael Assar and Josh King who, who you've got and they're, they're they're top level championship players you know a lot of them Premier League players and, and that could be key and then you know teams like Middlesbrough they, they've got Neil Warnock he's, he's streetwise he knows how to go about doing it and and as Caroline says that supporters not being in stadiums is such a big X factor that for all that that I feel confident about Stoke and, and the three promoted side could easily be none of those at the end of it and you know, that's why we love the championship really isn't it yeah, uh, Jeff, you almost seem to make a jive with regards to Matt's predictions there. Can you uh, shed some light on uh, what you're talking about there? Yeah, well, it was the, the the day that we were actually seventh in the Premier League, which is probably our highest ever position ever in the Premier League. And I was listening to uh, the Totally Football show, which I listened to religiously when we were in the Premier League. And Matt com comes on and says, oh, uh, yeah, my prediction for a team to get relegated is Bournemouth. And I, I nearly swerved off the road and hit somebody. <laughs> uh, I was that shocked. But actually, I've got to say how prescient, how how visionary that prediction was, because you got it right. And I, I don't know, was there anything at the time that made you think we were on a, a sort of downhill slide, Matt? There were a couple of things. I didn't think for a while that Bournemouth signings have been particularly impressive. I felt like you were kind of held over the coals a lot in terms of the fees you were paying for people like Dominic Solanke, I've seen an awful lot of, and people like Jordan Ive even before that. They felt like there was a kind of weird Bournemouth tax on these players that weren't Premier League regulars anywhere else. But the main thing for me was I looked at the rest of the Premier League teams that were struggling or going to struggle that season. And I could see all of them changing manager. And I couldn't see Bournemouth, no matter how the results went, sacking Eddie Howe. And I could just see, see him 
looking a bit forlorn and maybe looking like he was a little bit at the end of his tether and a little bit out of ideas, but it just felt like he, he was never going to walk away during the season and he was never going to be sacked. And it wasn't a loveless marriage by any means, but it clearly wasn't working at that point. And that's actually, that's why I was so surprised when they appointed Jason Tindall, because I thought they would just want an entirely new regime in there to kind of get rid of that, that relegation hangover. But by the looks of things, 11 games in, they made the right decision. But yeah, that was it, basically. I thought they're not going to get rid of Eddie Howe and, and maybe they ought to have done. And, and did you put money on it? Because somebody told me that your dad was operating the Hawkeye when we played, when we <laughs> played Sheffield United. You know what? I didn't put money on it, but I should have. That weekend that I said it, when you then went and won at Old Trafford. Wow. And, you know, I turned my phone off when you won at Stamford Bridge a couple of weeks later because it was melting from all the cherries in my um, notifications telling me that they thought perhaps that my prediction would be inaccurate, but but in slightly different language. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Caroline, what have you made of the three teams that uh, were relegated from the Premier League last season? How do you think they've started and do you think that they've adapted to the life in cha- in the Championship? I think out, out of all of them, and Norwich is still my my favourites to go up out of the three if if I had to hedge I think all three will be there or thereabouts but I would still think that they Norwich having started the season with, with some key personnel out Pookie looking at the real deal again the fact that they're scoring their, their late goals a bit of consistency when Deer as, as Matt mentioned I just think that they look like the team out of all three Watford phenomenal um, really to see them up in, in second, Ivic coming in. When you think about what he had to go through, not knowing, given the transfer window, what players he'd hang on to. And yet that squad is is immense. So you can see, you know, Gray and Hughes and, and Deeney are, are only going to get fitter and and better. Ken Semmer doing doing brilliantly. Sar as as you mentioned, Matt. So I I'm not entirely sure about where they go next, whether he'll try and, because he, he did the old shore everything up, KG start, um, try and make the best of the defence. But I kind of feel like he wants to go more of possession-based and be a bit more expansive with his team. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolution happens and, and works for him. And then looking at Bournemouth, well, I can't say anything negative, can I? I can't say anything <laughs> negative. Uh, Jason Tindall did it right from 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 the start I think and you're right Matt we all went didn't we do they want a clean break what are they doing employing someone that that's been within within the club system already but you would hope and I always think this surely the the owners talk to the to the players they talk to others around it and and the flip side of what what you say Matt is they know they know him best don't they they know what he's capable of so uh, yeah, I, th- I think that all three will be in that that top five. It's just how close to the top you get. Yeah, I think w- what I what I thought when we played Watford and the way that Watford have been playing, they look to me a bit like George Graham's Arsenal. Yeah, they defend very well, and they and they seem to enjoy getting one nil victories. I mean, I I I know they won three two at the weekend, but. Um, you know, they, they seem to be one of those teams that enjoy really grinding out a result under this new manager. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's, with with the 3-2, is that sort of a, a nod to more that we'll see from them? Um, because as I, say, I think that's probably the way he wants to play, is is sort the defence out and now go on the front foot. With, with Bournemouth... I, the Birmingham fans were raving, raving over over you after that result, that three one result, just saying that you're the best team that they've they've come up against this this season. So again, you, you take their word for it, um, what they've been exposed to. The other teams that I think will be up and I say Reading, I'm not entirely sure will last the course. I think you're right about Middlesbrough um, and and how well Neil Warnock has got them playing for Stoke. It's a, it's a year of Michael O'Neill around about now, isn't it? And, and they're, what, just just four points off the top. But look how many goals they've conceded. 12 goals already they've conceded this season. Their huge positive is I think they've had the one of the toughest fixture lists so far. Um, so they need to, I think they need to get a few more shots on target. That's been one of their 
their issues. I know they got that that three 0 win over Reading, but I think they're still sort of amongst the fewest shots on target in the league. So that's that's one of the areas that he'll be looking at adjusting. But being around Northern Ireland for the internationals and just seeing how Michael O'Neill is is worshipped, you just you just knew that he would get it right. He would get it right eventually. Yeah, mm. Matt, what, what do you think about Reading? Because some bloke called Daniel Story came on our show and tipped mm-hmm. them for relegation at the start of the season. It did. Yeah, I mean, that, to be honest with you, that wasn't a bad shout, I don't think. They've had a terrific start. I don't think they're going to maintain it, to be brutally honest, because I think the key thing in the Championship this season is going to be who's got the deepest squad. You know, you look at the fixture list in December, it is ludicrous. It is literally twice a week, at least, throughout the month for every team. And I just don't think that Reading have got the depth to, to keep up with the pace that they set in there, certainly in the first kind of seven or eight games of the season, it is turned off a bit since then. So then you are looking at the teams who came down from the Premier League. And, you know, if my team hadn't started so dreadfully, they'd be in the conversation. They still they still might. You know, their yeah. Forest squad is, is incredibly strong and incredibly deep. So they ought to be. And now they've got a, a manager who knows the division. So maybe they'll be able to have a late run at it. But now I've said that, my mind's flashing back to Stoke on the last day. And that's all I can think about. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the um, the fixture build-up in December. And we had a question from Steve Butler who said, he's always wondered, in brackets, in dismay, who decides the ludicrous amount of championship fixtures during that period? He goes on to say, apart from the logistics, the bad weather and the potential squad burnout, it must be some sort of EFL-designed masochism. <laughs> you think on that, Matt? <laughs> Well, you know, they've got to play 46 games in the season, haven't they? Unless you want to extend the season, which um, the clubs wouldn't be keen on. I think this is the only way that it can be done. And this season, obviously, it is just amplified because of the, the unique circumstances that, that we're playing in and the need to get get the season done, which is going to be a task in and of itself. So, unfortunately, it's the case every year that you say that the Championship's an endurance test. But this year, even more so, and it seems like kind of the welfare of the players is way down the list of priorities for for the league and, and the people who, who have a, a vested interest in it. Can I, um, can, can I ask you all a question? I don't know whether increasingly the amount of managers that we've, we've had into the studio that we've talked to, they all keep going on about the five subs. I know we've heard it in the Premier League. Mm. I just wonder how you, uh, the, the I think the, the daft thing about where we've heard it in the Premier League, that some of the teams that have been calling for it haven't even used three subs in a lot of their games. Anyway, it's a side issue. But mm. I just wonder if if though those noises will increase around Christmas again, particularly in the Championship too. And and you look again, it's just going to heavily favour, isn't it, those those teams with the bigger squads that we've already mentioned that we already think are going to do well at the top. I just wonder whether you, you thought it was something that, that they will go down, whether you like it or not. It's, it's 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 odd, I think. You know, we've been talking a lot as Bournemouth fans about squad rotation because that's what Jason Tindall's been doing, uh, swapping players in and out. And I don't think we've played the same side in consecutive games at the moment. And, uh, you know, he's coming for a bit of criticism because it, some of the games, it looks like the players haven't even met each other, let alone figured out how to pass the ball to each other. So, yeah. you know, it, rotation and a deep squad is great. But sometimes it doesn't work. And in some of the games, I mean, we were terrible against QPR and we were terrible against Sheffield Wednesday. And for both those games, I think we swapped out five players from the previous match. And in the last uh, fixture that we won convincingly against uh, uh, Birmingham City, we only made one substitution. Uh, And that was forced, I think, as well. So, you know, it's it's a bizarre one. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? You think... Because it, your first thought would be, we well, can't change the rules of the competition midway through it because that will undermine the integrity. But it seems unlikely at the moment. But there might be a circumstance in a few months' time whereby supporters are allowed back into the stadium and that will affect things massively. So that that undermines the integrity of the competition as well. So if you're going to allow that, then maybe you should change it and have five subs. I'd still keep it at three personally just because I think it's it ends up being massively un- unfair on, say, Wickham have to play Watford. And, yeah. you know, what- Watford can make three high-quality substitutions and-, and Wickham are bringing on the kit man, the tea lady, and a, a 14-year-old. 
Mm. I think I've seen how well that 14 year old plays though. <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty good as well, to be fair. T yeah. person, probably. I think one of the things that's really interesting is letting in some fans. I mean, the, again, one of the really tough away games we had was against Middlesbrough, where they had a thousand fans in the stadium, and they and they it was amazing. You know, just a small crowd like that, the referee started obviously gifting them decisions because the crowd were on his back all the time, and it was it was noticeable that that had an effect. And I think not having opposition fans at some of these grounds, I mean. I'd, I'd, I'd hate to go to Stoke with a full ground, but actually with an empty ground, we'd probably stand a better chance. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is more, it's much more of a leveller. And I would say that it's probably Bournemouth's best chance of getting promoted back to the uh, the Premier League straight away with no fans, because you reference those you know types of fixtures. Um, you know, the one at Middlesbrough as well, yes, they had a 1,000 fans, but you know, I can imagine 32,000 fans in the Riverside or however many they get. Stoke and other championship grounds where the crowd are a lot more you know, vociferous than we are at Dean Court, and it could make a massive difference. And Matt, would you say this, you know, this is a lever, and it should be a case that now the best team should win the league, whether it's in the Premier League, Championship League, one or whatever? Yeah, I mean, maybe, but that's not how football should work, is it? You you want to feel that supporters have a direct influence on results, and 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 that's that's been a really nice thing about the game and how it works. It's, you know, it's just a bit biased maybe to say this, but I always prefer, prefer the term supporters to fans because I think like fans are what Justin Bieber has, and supporters are what football clubs have. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe, but then you don't know. Is, is it going to be the best team? Is it is it going to be the team with the, the most players who prefer playing in front of no supporters than some supporters? Is it going to be the team who've got the manager with the loudest voice who can get on instructions to his players? Or is it just, again, as I said, an endurance thing, these players are the fittest, etc.? It's just miserable either way, basically, isn't it? I think it, at the start, we were so pleased to have football in any form back, but it just feels so barren and soulless to me still. I'm really struggling to get on board with football without supporters in the ground. I quickly went from listening without fake crowd noise to feeling like I really needed it to, to give some sort of, I don't know, legitimacy to the game almost. Otherwise, it does just feel like you're watching a training session. Yeah, I think uh, it's quite interesting because in terms of the psychology of the player mentality, Caroline, there are players for Bournemouth that... You know, there's been pressure on Dom Solanke's shoulders ever since he joined the club because of the price tag he was in. He was he scored um, a few goals uh, in Project Restart three, I think, and he hasn't had the best of starts in terms of his scoring. But his link-up play has been exceptional. But I, I get the feeling that in front of a crowd, he would probably feel the pressure more than what he is doing now. Would it be fair to say that some players actually might be thriving in this current environment? Yeah, we, we were having this chat. Um, I was at a game a couple of weeks ago, and I, I know it's a, a privileged position we get to be in, but when you're in, um, when you're in a ground, you yourself kind of sometimes find yourself wandering off a bit uh, in, mm. in, in your mind a little, which um, is, is such a shame given what you're watching in front of you. And this was, this was more towards the end of last season. And just because you'd be in a game and it'd be nil-nil and... The atmosphere was so sterile and you just longed for you've you probably sat and experienced it with one of your clubs when you when you're watching it. You think this game needs just a little bit of a niggly tackle, something yeah. just to get it going, just to to lift everyone. So you'd have those type of games where you'd be thinking, just needs a bit of something. And and maybe with with the fans, you go into that last 15 minutes, and maybe they're getting on the home sides back because they haven't scored and 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 how the the away side then feeds off that i mean we've seen um another stat they were saying on the not the top 20 was 27 percent of goals have come in the last 15 minutes so how much of that is about actually those clubs not feeling that that pressure in the last 15 and just knowing that you know that there was still enough time and we still wear them down whatever it might be it's still obviously playing a part and there is there's one manager who should remain nameless who said to me, my club always do badly during friendlies because we never have a lot of fans there. We need them there just to give us that boot up the, the backside. So that's the negative. But for young players coming through, mentioned Ivan Tony and, and 10 in, in 11 games, a lot of that you don't know 
how he would have performed either way uh, would that step up have been maybe would he have found that pressure extra had there been fans in there on top of him you know playing in a new stadium um playing for a new club all, all that that might have. we just don't know we just don't know and until we get back to a so-called normal season we're not going to know really are we and and that's why this is the season of all seasons I think Neil Warnock said it didn't he that just anyone can go up and anything can happen. But given that, it's the most important season to try and stay up financially and what that would mean for those clubs down the bottom. So that's where yeah. we've got to complete the season. We started it, we've got to complete it now. The manager that was uh, saying that his side don't play well in front of no fans because they think it's friendly, was that Philip Koku by any chance? No, <laughs> no, no. He's, he's not someone I've sat, sat down and had um, you know a, a long cup of tea with. Um, but that, I mean, that's just bizarre, isn't it? I don't, uh, who knows what's going to happen with Derby. There's all sorts of stories you hear about whether he will or won't go, um, whether the change in ownership is going to affect things, but, but Derby have had a, a rotten time of it. I know that Matt, you get Ryan Conway on a bit and talk to him a bit from the athletic, um, who's their Derby County writer. And I, I think he's brilliant, but, but some of his pieces on, and what's happening at Derby? Who knows what's happening at Derby? But there's again, again, you know, we've gone from thinking that Derby would be one of those teams that would be right up there. Look at where they were last season, and just in a matter of months, how far they've they've fallen. But you, you hit it on, hit that old nail on the head there. Why are they bottom when when Wickham lost their first seven and Sheffield Wednesday were deducted twelve, then six? You know, to be bottom with with what's gone on with those two clubs as well. I mean, glorious, I, just glorious. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, how do you feel about Forrest? Because Chris Hewton was once described as a Brighton coach as being a right back coaching as a, a right back would. Uh, I think Chris Hewton is brilliant. I think that he comes across as a really sincere, genuine, clever bloke. I'm really pleased that he's Forrest manager because he seems stable, which is what Forrest need. Um, it's not a huge thing, but I'm proud that Forrest have appointed successive black managers, which is something that there's there's far too few of um, in the AFL. Uh, you know, Forrest, the ownership is not particularly palatable to me, the way the clubs run, um, the background of the people who are in charge of it. So anything that reflects well on the club, any people involved in it that reflect well in, on it is fine with me. And, and, you know, I get the thing about Chris Hewton's style of football, but we watched Sabri Lamushi last season and, and his was exactly the same, if not even more defensive. And people loved him because, as ever, it comes down to what the results are. I'm one of those who's not particularly bothered if my team are playing like 1970 Brazil, so long as they win more than they lose. And and yeah. I think Chris Hewton almost guarantees you that. But But even if he doesn't, he's a dignified man. And, you know, we've had people like, Billy Davis in the past and Joe Kinnear and, and people who people laughed at Forrest when they were in charge. And I don't think that people people might say, oh, Chris Hewton, his football's a bit boring, but they won't they won't laugh at you. You won't be ridiculed because of what your manager does and says. Um, and for the moment, I'm fine with that. My expectations are pretty low because we, we haven't been promoted to the Premier League in 21 years. Um, so he hasn't got a very high bar to hit. But it, I'd rather him than any of the other candidates that, that were in for it, to be perfectly honest. Mm. All Bournemouth fans have got a soft spot for Forrest just because you've got Harry Arty, you know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, he's been all right so far as well, I think. Um, yeah, I was kind of surprised that, that he dropped back down into the Championship, actually. But I mean, we made, I think it's either 14 or 15 new signings. We, we you know, made 70 since the, the current owner took charge, which is just nonsense and no way to run a, a sustainable football club. And if we didn't have Gary Brazil looking after our academy, he's brought in in excess of £50 million pounds in, in transfer fees in players that he's trained on and the club are then sold, we'd be in all sorts of trouble. You know, we, we would be in massive financial problems. We'd have fallen foul of financial fair play, definitely, and we could easily be in League One by now if, if he wasn't there. So, yeah, him and Chris Hewton carry on. I think this is what makes the um, the championship such an exciting league. There are little stories like that you say about Nottingham Forest, and you've got the ex players to look out for. You've got the teams that have got such a, you know, an incredible history of winning European, uh, you know, championships, etc. Um, 
And then you've got the smaller teams like Wickham Wanderers that come in. And it's always been known globally as the, um, you know, one of the most exciting divisions um, in world football. But Jeff, would you say that this season, it seems that the quality is not there like it maybe previously has been? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to come across like, you know, super arrogant having come from the Premier League where you're seeing superstars. But you, you guys watch a lot of Premier League football too, right? You, you see the the standard in the in the Premier League. And I think it's interesting just seeing how teams like Fulham and West Brom and even now Leeds have been dropping a bit as well are finding it difficult to sustain in the Premier League. That gap between the Premier League and the Championship, I mean, it, it, it feels to me that technically gifted midfield players, there there aren't a huge number of them in the, in the Championship. Is that a fair comment, do you think, Caroline? Well, I don't know. We, we do this um, piece with the not the top 20 guys on on a Friday on Sky at the end about just the ones to watch throughout the EFL. And consistently, there are decent younger players coming through. I, th- I think the quality is there. It's just a, it's a blooming strange old season, isn't it? And, you know, there's all the talk about Wickham. And you can't, if, if, if teams get promoted, then they deserve to be there. Um, Coventry have, have picked up, I think they... They played six at the top seven, um, and and yeah, they're they're all all teams that are better, I guess, than they would have faced in in League One, fitness wise. They've changed their system. Mark Roms has, has changed that. They're they're adapting to life in the Championship. I think you've just got to give it time to to adapt to it. And I hate to break it to you, but you are in the Championship, and <laughs> you know that 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 quality is still there. Um, and I don't, I don't see Bournemouth or any one of these sides running away with it at the moment. And yeah, we, we, can, we can stand there and say, oh, it's not as good as the Premier League. It's not as good. But, but you've got Reading top. We've lost the last three games. So what happened What happened in the first 11 games with the rest of those sides? Not to be top. When you think of the, the huge gap that they'd opened up early in the season as well. So I think, it's, I think it's still there. I think we've still got tight games. I mentioned how many of those games have been tight already so we're not seeing the the well the, the blowouts that that maybe we might have seen so yet yet give it time let, let it settle you love it you love it and if I mean, not you're here so get on with it <laughs> and you know what for so many uh weeks and you know maybe even months in the premier league jeff i always thought that we were you know too good uh, to be relegated and uh, now I think we're too good not to go up but you know there have been some fixtures this season that are certainly be worried including that run of draws that we had and one thing though I'm certainly not missing and uh, well I think we all know what that is it's the dreaded VAR and I was watching Arsenal versus Aston Villa the other day with five minutes on the clock one minute of that was football and the other four minutes was waiting on VAR. It was it was it was awful to see. And I think with the championship it's it's a case of the you know the journey is much better than the destination because we, we love the ride this brings, but you know, going to back to the Premier League, it's brilliant with all its uh, you know footballing riches, but is it football anymore? I don't know. Matt, do you ever see a day where the championship's gonna be adopting it? Um, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I don't think it's going to be for a while. And actually, the effects of the pandemic on football finances might mean that that's delayed it still further because clubs won't want to dip into their own pocket, the likes of Wickham or whoever, to, to you know put in the facilities that you'd need to get to get VAR. But you know, if you ever complained about a refereeing decision before, then you can't complain about VAR because that that's what led us to this point, I think. And and people didn't take into consideration that all you'd be doing would be taking your complaints about one thing and putting it on something else. And <laughs> You're right, I don't like it. It does feel like it's it's a different kind of football, but the genie's out the, the lamp now and, and that's it. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's going to continue. It'll probably get... There'll probably be more interference, although I do think that this season in particular, the... I'm not sure about the rest of, of sort of European leagues that use VAR, but certainly the Premier League have taken the opportunity of not having supporters in the stadium to take longer and longer over the decisions that they're making because they know that there's not twenty to 50,000 people getting on the on-field referees back to hurry up and do something. So it gives them that licence to go and stand by the monitor and look at things hundreds and hundreds of times before before making a decision. But 
you know is it the technology or is it the laws and, and the way that they're being applied and yeah it's just it's just a different argument about the same thing essentially yeah, well, the, the uh, and, and how that's being applied is yeah. is naff right now isn't it um the the margins of offside naff but I, I applaud the fact that we're seeing it should have happened from the start. The referee's going over and having a look on. It should always come down to who's the referee on the pitch making that, that final decision. Although uh, I just I don't buy this. We've got to have acres of acres of, of footage showing it in, in slowed down by an oomph to another oomph because that's not, that's not the real-time view of it. So that's what I find frustrating. Yeah, yeah football, football should be like life, shouldn't it? Life is imperfect, yeah, should be. and so football should be that way. I'm, I'm much more into kind of, I don't know, the sociological and chaotic aspect of football than I am into the into the tactical minutiae of it. And yeah, this just feels a bit more sort of robotic and not like real life, where things happen that are unjust and unfair, and then you you deal with it, adapt, and and carry on. Are you hanging up when we talk extremes then? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we were just coming on to that. <laughs> yeah, well, just that that four minutes that um, we were waiting for that decision in the Arsenal Aston Villa match uh, was, you know, I I hop back to a number of years ago where James Hayter scored a hat trick in two minutes and twenty seconds. So, you know, on that scoring rate, I think he'd have like, notched about five by the time that decision was made. But alas, um, you know, hopefully it won't affect us um, if we stay in the championship. But fingers, we've, you know, we will be getting back to the Premier League. But we, we hope that that whole process is, is made a lot quicker because it's uh, certainly sucking the enjoyment out. You know, for me, uh, well, I don't watch match day much these days, but you know, when I do, it's, it's not a great watch. Um, let's swing things back to AFC Bournemouth then. Um, we are fourth in the league at the moment on 20 points. Jeff, I'll put this one to you first before uh, Matt and Caroline. How do you think that we've adapted to the change of pace uh, dropping down a division? Hmm. I think um, I think we found the way the opposition play a bit more intense than perhaps we expected. You know, I think I think the, the I think we've started a lot of games this season thinking that we're better technically and that if another team presses us, then they'll run out of steam by about half time. And in fact, they don't run out of steam. They keep going till about 80 minutes. And and, and I don't think the players have really coped that well with that. Um, so I think that extra pace and intensity of, of championship football has been a bit of a problem for the, the team. And it's only in those games where we've actually applied more energy than we normally would like against Birmingham in that last game, where we've actually, you know, stood out and, and got a bit of space. And I think I think it has been a bit of a shock, actually. I mean, it, it, it's the way the Championship's played, isn't it? You know, it's an intense physical battle, 90% of the time, actually. Mm, that's right. And we had a question from um, Craig Beasley, and he basically said the same thing. As we found out, the Premier League, you get more time on the ball, whereas in the Championship, the pace seems a little bit more intense. He asks, uh, this was to Matt, is this similar for League One to the Championship? Because it seems that teams coming up from League One seem to struggle a bit more. But uh, I'm not sure if you typed that before uh, Wickham had their you know, mini run. But, um, what's your opinion on that, Matt? It's difficult to, to call it on anything but a club-by-club -club basis, to be honest, because you've got Wickham who, who came up, you know, despite having one of, if not the smallest budgets in League One, but then you've got clubs like Sunderland and Portsmouth as well, and you feel like if they get back up, then they would be able to quickly put together a, a championship squad. So I think you, you can't really talk about it collectively like that in terms of the difference between League One and the championship. I think it's that there's less of a difference between that than there is between the championship and the Premier League, but... You know, I remember when Forest were in League One, it took three seasons to get out and it was absolutely horrendous. For two of those seasons, we were we were dreadful and we only got promotion on the final day when we did. So League One doesn't hold happy memories for me, basically, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think you look, look at the way um, you know, Luton are going about things this season. It does take time to, to work out the league and any jump up that, that you make. Wickham, where they've got joys, when they've gone on the, the press, when they've really been in the faces of these these teams. And, but it's, it's just, and I mentioned the fitness levels with commentary, a lot of their fans have spoken about that. It's just maintaining that and getting up to that 
to that level. Teams like Coventry as well, because of the the points per game and the way it worked out, they you know they had longer off. Um, so you can argue as longer to get get used to things, but they had to get back up and, and running again. I think you have to, to look at managers that work it out too. I've been so impressed with Steve Cooper and Swansea, and they've got a bit more consistency about them this season. Um, I think they were another team that would be there or or thereabouts. So it's yeah, it, it's on that individual team basis, and it just takes time to work it out. Just working out what what the championships like, but I think that's for teams coming down as as much as it's coming up. You've got is it you've got Reading next, haven't you? I mean, there's yeah. a yeah kind of judging where both those teams are. Um, how you, you talked about how difficult they Reading were to break down before they've had this this little slump. Do they get back to that? And and how difficult will Bournemouth find it to to break Reading down? Can Reading actually show that they are worthy of being up where they are? So I think that's, that's a really and it's these these mini little games within the season that sort of these how we'll see them as defining moments or, or judging really what the true colours of these teams and and where they are going to to end the season where what position they'll end in. Interesting, you talk about Swansea there, Caroline. I just wonder the other two sides that didn't make it. I mean, one we haven't talked about at all, Brentford, who who actually most people thought would get past Fulham, but they didn't. And and also Cardiff, who have who've sort of started OK, but are, are sort of languishing a bit in mid-table at the moment. I mean, Matt, where, where do you think those playoff contenders from last season stand at the moment? Cardiff's a weird one. I don't, I don't yeah. really get that because they, they sort of went into the, the playoffs on, on the crest of a way, but not expected, I don't think, by many people to, to win them. So I don't think you can really talk of a hangover there. I can't quite figure that out. Um, Brentford, obviously, Tony's come in, but they've had some some big departures. I think that they they will definitely be in a playoff position, probably higher than that even. And Swansea, I think what is massively in their favour is that their manager, I think, must have the best connections for loan signings of anybody in the Championship because he was... You know, the man who led England to the to the under seventeen World Cup, and you saw him get reimbursed the last season. Conor kind of Gallagher, Mark Gerhey, as well from Chelsea. If come January they're either a little bit off the pace or looking like they can go for automatic promotion, they might be able to do something like they did last season, where they convinced Chelsea that that Swansea was a better destination for Conor Gallagher to be for the second half of the season than Charlton was, and in mm. you know almost cherry pick the best young players from academy football, elite academy football in the country. I think that's such a big bonus for them. And I bet that the people in charge of the club love him, love him for it too, because it's obviously far cheaper than signing players on a permanent basis. Cardiff have got the uh, Neil Harris Derby coming up as well, aren't they? They're back with uh, ah, Millwall when, they're, when they come out of it. So, yeah, I think... I, I, I'm not entirely sure comfortable with the way this... I mean, I'm not a Cardiff City fan, so what, what does it matter what I think? But, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not entirely sure that that he's getting the best out of that team at the moment. Um, but I've got no doubt that that they've got quality quality there. Uh, 15th at the moment. It's, it's just tight in there and around there. Or Preston just above them. Huddersfield, who you know, so many people were, were doubting what they were doing, getting rid of of the Cowleys and yet Carlos Corbyn's doing all right, isn't he? So, you know, you just it's we still I still think we need another five games to be anywhere close to judging judging where this all where this is going. Well another sort of sleeping giant is Sheffield Wednesday, of course, and they started with that points deduction. Points deduction's been halved and they've sat Gary Monk. So where do you where do you see them? I mean, they're the only team to have beaten us this season. Depends who they appoint, I suppose. I mean, yeah. it looks, looks like it's going to be Tony Pulis, um, which, I don't know, was he that great at Middlesbrough? I'm not sure that that his last couple of jobs have been massively successful, but that's what it's all about for them, isn't it? You know, I, I would, we've just been talking about this, actually, on recording the Totally Football Show before I, I joined you, and um, Dom Fifield, who was with us, was making the case for Sol Campbell, who he had just been to interview. Um, for the Athletic and he's desperately trying to get a job somewhere and I think that what he did at Macclesfield is so overlooked you know because of what's happened to Macclesfield since then it's almost been completely forgotten that is one of the most remarkable feats 
by a manager in the AFL in the last decade for me that he managed to keep them up. And then he went to South End and had no chance. You know, nobody could have, could have stopped them from getting relegated last season. So I'd love to see Sheffield Wednesday give somebody like him a try because Pulis just feels a bit safe. Um, but, you know, if they end up getting promoted, then they won't be bothered about that too much. But, you know, they, they all they can do this season, I think, is is try and stay up because they left themselves in, in such a difficult position with the points deduction, even though it was halved, you know, it, it affected the type of players that they could bring in during the summer. I would be staggered if they got if they got anywhere near the top six. Hmm. He'll be the, uh, whoever they put in will be the, the fifth person in charge since 2015, summer of 2015. And that, again, it's just not creating consistency. Well, you know all about that at Nottingham Forest. There's, I was just saying, they're numbers. forest numbers for managers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, <laughs> that's, and that's not going to help anyone, is it? I, I know ultimately was that was that the undoing with, with Eddie Hound. Sometimes you can go too long, can't you? But pff, yeah. just at, yeah. at some stage you've got to pick and stick, haven't you? Yeah, I yeah. think... Uh, uh, with the Eddie Howe thing, I think I think we're now coming to the view that he probably was he, he needed a season off. That's what he needed yeah. last season. But it, it also I look at people like uh, Daniel Farker at Norwich, and I wonder whether he might be coming to a bit of the end of his kind of era as well. It, it, Norwich uh, Norwich seem to be playing, um, getting results, but they're not exactly lighting up the league with that squad. You know, they're they're winning a lot of games one nil. In fact, the, the only game they lost was to Derby, who are bottom. And you sort of, you just sort of wonder whether Falker might be, I don't know, what what more what more can he do with that team? Yeah, very, I thought I thought he was kind of he was very downbeat toward the end of last season. Yeah, they got relegated with a real whimper, didn't they, Norwich? And he wasn't exactly bigging up his players or the, or the the future for the club but the fact that they've stuck with him and and they're doing all right and he's got the players that we've mentioned but also he's got Puki who scores goals at this level for fun I think they'll be all right Norwich they'll, they'll probably be around the playoffs again okay so uh you know what I, just a quick question before we get your uh, predictions because we can wrap up soon um Matt a lot of Bournemouth fans have been looking at um Bournemouth not having a 20 goal a season striker. Um, is it possible to get promoted out of the championship without that kind of heavy goal scoring striker? Yeah, it is possible. Um, it, it obviously makes it more difficult, but you don't want to be like, not to bring it back to Forest all the time, but we were so reliant on Lewis Graben last season. Nobody else was chipping in with any goals and that became a problem, the over-reliance on one player. So when he got an injury or lost a bit of form like he has done this season, where do you turn after that? But I don't want to quite give up on Dom Solanke yet. You know, I watched him uh, at a season for, for Chelsea where he played for the under-18s in the Youth Cup and the under-23s in that league, and he scored 42 goals, and he was absolutely ruthless. You know, um, Sam Parkin, who Caroline and I know well, used to say he goes cold in front of goal. He just forgets about anything else other than scoring, and he really, really was ruthless. And I always thought he didn't have much more to his game, but you don't need much more than that. So I'm surprised at how much he struggled. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be totally, totally surprised if he doesn't come good in the second half of the season. Maybe for for Bournemouth because he's definitely a player there. You know, he's, he's, he was on the bench in a Champions League final a couple of years ago. He's, he's yeah. got something about him. I I compare him a bit, um, Matt, to when Tammy Abraham went to Swansea. You know, actually going to the Championship might actually help him get a bit of self belief and confidence. Yeah, yeah. And Tammy certainly did that at Bristol City as well when he went there. Um, he's just got a bit more to his game than than Solanke has, I think. But yeah, definitely, this is this is a season. It's a make or break season for him, either way. Uh, I think that he that he will make, but but this is a big moment in his career. So um, hopefully he can, uh, you know, kick start us uh, to promotion. Uh, Jeff, your three teams to get promoted. Uh, of course, one of them is going to be Bournemouth, isn't it? Yeah, one of them is Bournemouth. Yeah, I think I think we'll probably win it. I'm going on record and saying that we'll win it. But, you know, I'm biased obviously. I think second and third, I think I think Stoke is probably quite a good call. I think they'll be up there. Definitely my tip to make it probably through the playoffs and I think Watford will get the second spot because we always go up and down with Watford, don't we? Yeah, oh yeah. We, yeah, we're like the ugly sisters, aren't we? We just are <laughs> inseparable. Um Caroline, um what's your punch at the moment? Uh Bournemouth, I have to do. Uh, I just have to. Um, Bournemouth, <laughs> yeah, I, have to. I, I still think Middlesbrough will mix it in there. 
as well. So either Watford or Norwich in there with, with Middlesbrough for me. I'm up. Uh, I have a moral obligation to pick Nottingham Forest Football Club, despite the last years of 21, uh, 21 years worth of evidence to the contrary. So I'll put them in. I'll put Stoke, as I said. And my third team, I am going to go for Brentford. What about you, Sam? Who are you going to go for? You know what? I'm not going to go for Bournemouth, Jeff. Of course I am. Of course I am. Yeah, so it's going to be Bournemouth. Um, also, I think Watford. And I actually think Norwich. I think it's going to be the three teams that went down and going to go straight back up. But, that, you know, that's my thoughts. We'll, we'll see how it all pans out. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for your contributions today. Really appreciate it. Um, Caroline Barker, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And also Matt Davies-Adams. Really, uh, really glad to have you on. No problem. Thank you for being magnanimous enough to, to, to let me come on and, and talk about Bournemouth. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And Jeff, once again, it's been a pleasure. I was going to say, yeah, Matt, Matt Davis-Adams, he's, he's more welcome than Ryan Fraser in Bournemouth, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the less said about that, the better. And thank you all uh, for watching as well. Um, if you want to give this video a thumbs up, we'd really appreciate it. And of course, subscribe to this channel too for more cherries slash championship content. We'll see you in the next video. Up the cherries.